So hello, I'm Jackie McGuire. Uh, I handle market strategy for security at Cribble. Uh, my background is as a data scientist, so I uh, started my career at Wall in Wall Street, uh, 2005, right before the financial crisis, and kind of managed portfolios through the financial crisis and realized that a lot of the poor decisions that people were making was based on bad data or based on data that they had but didn't have enough context to do something good with. So I kind of made a career in Wall Street by giving people context to help them make better decisions with their money. Moved over to Silicon Valley Bank and did that for companies with their startup capital. So it was not long after a couple of the larger firms in Wall Street froze a bunch of cash in uh, Silicon Valley and people went bankrupt because they literally couldn't access the millions of dollars they had in the bank. So I helped companies write investment policies um, and gave them good data on how to um, really think about money um, when you're a startup. So when I decided I wanted to leave finance, um, after realizing that most of the world's problems were caused by bad data or data without context, I went to the UC Berkeley Data Boot Camp and I became a, a data scientist. My capstone project, I took a million book cover images from Amazon and did care, uh, image analysis on them and then associated that with the rating on Amazon and developed this model that could judge a book by its cover. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Which is kind of silly, but it made me happy. And the uh, data scientist at this sim startup called Ed Lumen reached out to me and said, hey, I saw um, your code from this project you did, and it was really cool. So I joined this security startup, and basically my job was to do um, UEBA and anomaly detection and other types of kind of behavior and analytics. So um, what I really figured out there is, again, we have a huge data problem. And when you're dealing with security data, the sheer velocity of the data, the sheer volume that you're dealing with makes it very difficult to um, really understand what's going on and to really have a full picture of what you're dealing with in a cost-effective way. So uh, evolution of security, I probably don't need to tell you guys this, but at the beginning we kind of had antivirus and a firewall. And it was kind of if you, you keep everybody outside the firewall, once they get in, we're okay. And that didn't work, right? We were missing all these threats, either because they got in the firewall, because they went around the firewall. So we started making products to solve these problems. And this is what we ended up with. So we have this crazy kind of mosaic of tools that is <laughs> that are all kind of disparate, and we're still losing things. We're still not finding threats. And now we're losing threats in a sea of false positives rather than losing them because we don't see them at all. Uh, the Internet of Things has become the Internet of Threats, so we're looking at about 45 billion connected devices um, by 2025. And each of these devices that's connected is producing this massive stream of volume, stream of data that we're trying to deal with. So uh, Nick and I being former analysts, what we wanted to know is what are people doing? And we looked around for uh, security data data, and we couldn't find it. So we decided to do our own. So we did this survey of about a 1,000 people, and we tried to do VP of security and CISOs. We ended up with what we called the state of security data management. So we asked people, how are you handling these, these problems? And our results show that people are working really closely with IT and with external service providers. A lot of the customer, almost all the customers we talk to use some type of external service provider. They're managing dozens and dozens of tools, as Nick alluded to, and they're still struggling to build sustainable architecture. This, this statistic was, when we got the results, I, <laughs> I was a little jarred. Um, so 63% of our customers said their strategy was sustainable for less than three years when it came to managing security data. And about half of those people said that their security data strategy was sustainable for 12 months or less. But virtually all of them said that they were confident in their data management strategy. So we've just start, we really need to talk about how we define success in data management because if a strategy that's only sustainable for a year at a time is giving people confidence, that's probably a problem. Um, six, you know, two thirds of our customers are using more than 25 tools, and it seems like every time an issue occurs, there's retail therapy, and we just add another tool to try to address um, you know, symptoms of problems as they come up. It's 40 percent of our customers are planning to add more tools. Um, here's another one that was one of the 
bright spots in um, our data, which is that I have always had this probably preconceived notion that security and IT don't always play well together. Sometimes we, we compete for budget, sometimes we compete for data, but I think that's starting to change some out of necessity, some out of we've added so many people to security that don't have those preconceived notions that they work really well with IT. Um, but virtually, you know, nine out of 10 of our customers told us that they actually, this is not a thing anymore. So how did we get here, right? We, we have a unsustainable data strategy. We have dozens and dozens of tools and still 80% uh, of customers surveyed have had some type of compromise in the last 12 months. So we have three huge problems. The first one is data you can't afford, right? So security is unfortunately a cost center. Security doesn't produce revenue. We cost a lot of money. And so when we make decisions with regard to security, sometimes they're budgetary. So when you can't afford data, to Nick's point, most companies just aren't collecting requests in response for DNS. If they are, sometimes they stop collecting them towards the end of the month because they're hitting their data caps. Most companies don't uh, collect network flows. Talked to a university a couple weeks ago who wasn't collecting any of their web requests when that's their single largest attack surface. Um, so we're making a lot of compromises with our data because we can't afford it. And there's also this really interesting thing that's happening where because a lot of the data is noisy, we're using really inefficient means to handle the noise in that data. So I know we all love regex and get up first thing in the morning just dying to write regex expressions. <laughs> I personally forget it literally the second I stop using it and every time I have to look up how to write them again. Um, Regex doesn't just suck to use, it's also extremely inefficient from a code perspective. And as a data scientist, I might not think it's a big deal to handle a syslog thing coming in with regex because I'm running the code once. But when you start running that on millions of logs coming through every day, the bloat associated with handling some of these issues in line causes ripple effects. Um, when I was a data scientist, I was training a neural network for UABA and I hit a button, went to lunch, came back, and had run up a $75,000 AWS bill because I forgot to limit the number of JSON uh, dictionaries I returned. And I think the interesting thing with cloud computing is they, it's been presented as, you know, it's this wonderfully endlessly scalable solution, which is true, but that has also removed most engineers from the server impact of their actions. So I think we need to think about when we create inefficient code, when we're not handling data correctly, that that has pretty far reaching implications that we're just starting to kind of be able to put a price tag on. Uh, then there's data that you just can't see. So um, I know not a single one of you has field or naming convention issues. You all have perfectly well set up environments, but what we're seeing a lot is that when you go to do incident response or when you go to you know, collect data in the first place, naming conventions, um, different a data by a different name, when you go to query and do incident response, we're missing a lot of data. And we see this with organizations a lot, and then they pay to bring a third party in who finds the data and says, hey, you really need to fix how you're doing this. So when you have us in the middle, um, like Nick talked about, we can fix a lot of these issues by standardizing a lot of these um, fields when they come in, and then search will be able to find them for you. And then lastly, if you can afford it and you can see it, it's not really useful without context. So this is the thing that has been a recurring theme my entire adult life, is that people, even with good data, if they don't have context for it, will make bad decisions. So a lot of customers are collecting IP, but not necessarily doing enrichment on their IP addresses. And it's pretty useless to collect an IP address if you don't collect the geolocation of it and you don't provide context. Um, another thing I see pretty frequently is uh, timestamp issues. So a lot, not that any firewall ever misconfigures timestamps, but this log is actually from October 22nd, 2020. And we don't know if that was this is actually from two years ago, or if the log is actually just getting incorrect timestamps coming through. Um, that's another thing that Cribble handles really well, and is also another thing that by dropping, um, a lot of firewall logs have like two or three timestamps in their headers, and just by dropping the entire header and standardizing your timestamp, you can save like 30% on your firewall logs. 
Uh, so Nick already went through this, but this is my version of what Cribble does. Um, so to solve this problem, Cribble really takes your lucky charms and separates out the marshmallows. And for sugar addicts like me, that's a phenomenal thing. But not everybody wants that much sugar. Sometimes you actually need the cereal intact in case somebody comes over and you don't want them to know you're an overgrown child. Sometimes you want to put the cereal in the cupboard and later you might want to sort the marshmallows out. And that's kind of what Cribble gives you the opportunity to do. Unfortunately, in security, it seems like rather than putting the right data through our SIM, we make a decision that we're either gonna, gonna put it all or none of it. And so that's kind of the equivalent of if you flush your toilet, your shower and your sink run at the same time. What Cribble allows you to do is take the right kinds of data and put them through the very expensive analytics tools that you're using, and then take full data if you need it for retention purposes, if you're a highly regulated business, or if you just want it for incident response and investigation, and put it somewhere that's a lot less expensive to store, like a data lake. And then again, Cripple Stream will allow you, if you at some point shoved a bunch of that data into your data lake and say, we actually want to put that through more robust processing, we want to put it through a new analytics tool, we need to do uh, investigation or incident response, Cribble will also allow you to pull it back out of object storage and do some of that more costly processing if necessary. But the concept here is put the right data in the right places and don't pay to process data that you're not actually getting any value out of.